imagine that the dollar will lose its value. Yes, I mean, it already lost 95% of its value since the introduction of the Federal Reserve, but it took 100 years. This time around, they'll do it in 10 years. They have become more efficient. They than have. Losing, yeah. <laughs> Mark thinks they're going to create inflation. Now, the president of Japan suggests that these guys are Muppets. These, the president of Japan suggests that when it comes to the organization of economic affairs, if you allow leverage in your society to breach a certain level, we're not sure what that level is, but let's call it 200 or 230 percent of GDP, then what happens is monetary policy doesn't work. Fiscal policy doesn't work. So Japan is an example where we've had hideous politicians and hideous intervention. They've had helicopters. They have distributed free money to, the, to all of their citizens. They've built bridges to nowhere. And prices are falling and they look set to fall further. This decade, NIA believes the U.S. will experience an outbreak of hyperinflation that will cause the U.S. dollar to become worthless. Most economists believe the U.S. is more likely to experience a lost decade of deflation similar to Japan after the bursting of their bubble economy. In Japan, even with prices deflating, many Japanese today are being forced to live in internet cafes or closets. In Tokyo, there are hundreds of cyber cafes like this one that offer overnight deals. You can stay in your own cubicle with unlimited net access, free drinks and an easy chair to sleep on, all for about eight pounds. And without a place to stay, for Nagasaki, this was better than sleeping on the streets. This was home for Hidefumi Ito. The size of a closet, it had what he needed most, an internet hookup and computer to job search. Ito rented this net room for around 20 U.S. dollars a day after he lost his art gallery director job, his expensive home, and went bankrupt. Then his wife and three children left him. <laughs> With average GDP growth of 10% in the 1960s, 5% in the 1970s, and 4% in the 1980s, Japan's GDP grew to the second largest in the world. However, during the years 1986 to 1991, a bubble formed in Japan. The Nikkei stock index nearly quadrupled in five years to reach a high in 1989 of 38,957. Altogether, between the years 1955 and 1990, Japan stock prices appreciated 100 times in value and land prices increased 70 times in value. By 1993, Japan's bubble burst with both stock market and real estate prices being cut in half. Throughout the 1990s, Japan experienced deflation, high unemployment, and no economic growth which led to the Bank of Japan deciding to lower interest rates in 2001 down to 0%. Despite 0% interest rates for many years, the Nikkei fell to a 26-year low in October of 2008 of 6,994, a shocking decline of 82% from its high 19 years earlier. A large part of Japan's savings has been wiped out and many Japanese can no longer afford to retire. Setsuko Katayama is part of a growing trend proving to be at least a short-term fix. At 68, she is one of more than three and a half thousand elderly people working at this burger chain alone. The oldest is 84. All across the country, people are giving up retirement to keep making ends meet. While that's good for the economy, many elderly people would logically rather be enjoying their golden years somewhere else. Japan's official debt-to-GDP ratio is currently 203% compared to the U.S. debt-GDP ratio of 91.5%. This has led to hundreds of NIA members asking us why we believe the U.S. will experience hyperinflation while Japan has experienced decades of deflation. About 95% of Japan's debt is held domestically within the country. Although Japan's savings rate has declined in recent years, down to 3% due to their aging population and their retirement age being raised to 65, Japan's savings rate averaged above 10% for many decades and during the mid-1970s averaged above 20%. The Japanese built a large pool of savings that allowed their government to borrow from its own citizens. 
The U.S. government, on the other hand, has borrowed $4 trillion from foreigners, including nearly $1 trillion from Japan. Foreigners currently hold about $10 trillion in U.S. dollar-denominated assets. Because of the dollar's status as the world's reserve currency, these dollars are being hoarded by foreigners and aren't chasing goods and services here in America. With the phony U.S. economic recovery beginning to lose steam, NIA believes the world will soon wake up and realize that U.S. budget deficits are poised to explode to new highs this decade due to the rising interest payments on our national debt and rising entitlement spending. With Japan's declining savings rate, the Japanese barely have enough savings left to fund their country's own budget deficits. How on earth will Japan continue to lend money to the U.S. so that we can fund ours? They can't, and they won't. The loss of our second largest creditor will be the breaking point for the U.S. economy. The U.S. debt Ponzi scheme will soon come to an end. To better understand why the U.S. is poised to have hyperinflation and won't get off so easily with a lost decade of deflation like Japan, let's imagine that all countries simultaneously experience hyperinflation and all fiat currencies worldwide become worthless overnight. Imagine that all debts worldwide are wiped out and the world starts fresh tomorrow with new currencies. Which country do you think will prosper based solely on real economic fundamentals? A country with Toyota and Honda, two automobile manufacturers that combined for a net income in fiscal year 2008 of $23.2 billion. Or a country with GM and Ford, two automobile manufacturers that combined for a net loss in fiscal year of 2008 of $45.5 billion. If it wasn't for government bailouts, GM and Ford would be out of business today. And without the U.S. having the world's reserve currency, it won't be possible for the U.S. to make any more bailouts in the future. If we start over from scratch, Japan will still have its television manufacturers like Sony, Mitsubishi, Hitachi, Panasonic, Funai, Sharp, and Toshiba. The U.S. doesn't have any television manufacturers, and Americans won't have any way of importing televisions. Japan had a huge trade surplus in fiscal year 2009 of $56.2 billion, while the U.S. had a gigantic trade deficit of $374.9 billion. Both countries import most of the oil they consume, but while Japan can afford to pay for its oil by exporting automobiles and televisions, the U.S. has only been able to afford its oil imports by exporting inflation. In just the first five months of 2010, the U.S. had a $7.6 billion trade deficit with Saudi Arabia, more than double its trade deficit with Saudi Arabia of $3.5 billion during the first five months of 2009. Saudi states now own $235.1 billion worth of U.S. Treasuries, which NIA believes they could be getting ready to dump. The Saudi Arabian Monetary Agency just reported last month that their gold reserves have more than doubled to 322.9 tons, up from 143 tons of gold reported in March. Clearly, Saudi Arabia believes their U.S. dollar reserves are about to lose their purchasing power and they are trying to hedge against it by diversifying into gold. Agriculture is the one bright spot for the U.S. economy. While Japan is the world's largest importer of food and has an agricultural self-sufficiency rate of only 50 percent, the lowest among developed nations, the U.S. on the other hand produces enough agricultural products to be entirely self-sufficient. Unfortunately, if the U.S. can no longer afford to import oil, there will be a huge drop-off in U.S. agricultural production. Oil is essential to modern agricultural techniques used in the U.S. today. Oil is used for operating field machinery, manufacturing inorganic fertilizer, irrigation, crop drying, raising livestock, and pesticide production. The biggest agricultural use of oil is getting the food to our supermarkets. 81% of Americans now live in cities and suburbs, compared to the worldwide average of 49%. On average, most food in your supermarket travels 1,500 miles before getting there. 
Even if Americans cut their personal oil use for transportation by 75%, we still won't have any oil left from our domestic oil production to produce and ship food. The U.S. budget deficit in fiscal year 2009 as a percentage of GDP was 9.9%. However, using the same accounting principles that American businesses are forced to use, our real budget deficit in 2009 was 30.3% of GDP because we saw a $3 trillion increase in non-cash obligations for entitlement programs. This is more than three and a half times higher than Japan's budget deficit to GDP ratio last year of 8.5%. The real U.S. debt to GDP ratio is also a lot higher than Japan, including unfunded liabilities for entitlements and our government's guarantee of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Total U.S. obligations have now reached $80.9 trillion, or 560% of GDP, nearly triple Japan's debt-to-GDP ratio of 203%. Japan's economy hit peak consumer spending in 1990 and entered their lost decade from a position of strength with a balanced budget, high savings rate of 15%, low unemployment rate of 2%, and a net debt to GDP ratio of less than 20%. With the average American peaking in spending at age 46 and the last baby boomer turning 46 in 2010, the U.S. has just passed peak consumer spending and has entered this new decade from the weakest possible position with a real budget deficit of $4.3 trillion, a savings rate of only 4%, a real unemployment rate of 22%, and a real debt-to-GDP ratio of 560%. The U.S. has entered this decade from the complete opposite position that Japan was in during the 1990s, so instead of seeing deflation, NIA believes the U.S. is guaranteed to enter into hyperinflation. If you would like to not only survive but prosper during U.S. hyperinflation, sign up immediately for the free NIA newsletter at inflation.us. You will receive weekly articles from NIA with the facts and truth about the U.S. economy and inflation. Becoming educated is the most important first step all Americans need to make in order to survive hyperinflation. At the end, I can reconcile this thing. I think, ultimately, Mark will be right, because he always is.